So, this story took place when I was 12 years old. I'm a female, and it's more than half of my lifespan ago, but I still get really uneasy when thinking back to it. I try to block it from my mind and not guess as to what could have happened if not for two kind strangers. I was walking home from school one day, four kilometer walk along a busy road. I was walking alone, however, and at one of the intersections I crossed there was a tall, dirty looking man that noticed me. I would guess his age was maybe early thirties. Now being a kid back then I struggled telling the age of adults and he starts following me and trying to strike up a conversation. He kept telling me that I was beautiful and that he wants us to be friends. He asked me where I live and if my parents would be home. He asked me so many questions, but I tried to just shrug him off and be polite. I didn't answer any of his questions, just increased the pace at which I walked. When we were nearing the block on which I lived, I started becoming really uneasy. He wanted to follow me home, and I did not want him to. He gave off a weird vibe because adults don't usually speak to me that way. The only way that I could get rid of him would be to give him my cell phone number and agree to answer when he calls. Because the situation made me uncomfortable, I gave him a fake number and hightailed it out of there. A few months passed without me running into that man again, so I completely put this out of my mind. He was probably just some random weirdo. However, as you can guess from here, things did not stay that way. One day, approximately four months later, I found myself walking home after school again. I will admit that I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings. That was until I heard what sounded like footsteps running up behind me. I reflexively turned to look around and it was that same creepy man that I had encountered before. He slowed his pace as he reached me but yelling the entire time. He figured out that I had given him the wrong number and he was furious. He kept yelling and yelling that I think I'm better than him and that's why I gave him a fake number. Now I was terrified in that moment as he was very angry. I was afraid that he was going to hurt me but couldn't grab the attention of any passing motorists. I sped walked to the closest petrol station, which is luckily not too far, with him following behind me, still yelling the entire time. When I got to the petrol station, I immediately got the attention of two burly men standing next to their pickup truck. They must have seen the terrified look on my face and the man following me as they immediately ran over to ask if I was alright. I was too scared to speak, just shook my head frantically as I tried to get behind them. They immediately demanded to know why the man was following me. He fed them some BS line about being my older brother and I just silently kept shaking my head. I guess they figured out what was happening at this point as they started yelling at the man, accusing him of something. I didn't stay to find out. I took that opportunity of him being distracted to start running away. The man noticed that I was leaving and tried to take off after me. The burly men really took offense to this as they immediately tackled him and threw him in the back of their pickup. He was screaming at this point. They sped off with the guy at an inconceivable speed right past me and just kept going. I was happy that they took him away but I didn't stop running until I reached home. I had no idea what to make of this entire exchange, but it really shook me to the core. I did not know where they took that creepy guy or what they did with him after. In all honesty, I didn't want to know. I told my parents and altered the route that I walked home from school. I never saw him again and I'm thankful for that. Even though I couldn't say what I needed in that moment, those two kind strangers saw that I was in distress and dealt with it for me. Even after all these years, I still remember the sheer terror and then relief when they took him away. I work a graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. Can't say the company name for obvious reasons. I've been on this site for two weeks, this being the second. Basically every hour I make rounds across a giant recycling yard covered in various precious metals that are broken down and sold. During my shift I scan various checkpoints and ensure nobody besides me is in the yard or facility. 
One of my other tasks is to go through some grassy, bushy terrain and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of a warehouse far across. This is to ensure that it's safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2K lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. Well, just an hour and a half ago on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. I took the picture of the warehouse and submitted it, and all of a sudden... I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. My hairs on my neck are standing up and I freeze. My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse. I slowly turn around and point my flashlight behind me. I kid you not, about ten yards away, I see a skinny, old, wrinkled, white man with a large white beard sitting on a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls and what I think was a western style cowboy fedora on. He was bearskin under the overalls. Now I'm 6 foot 220 pounds but I screamed out like a little girl at a pitch that was very embarrassing. Accidentally I dropped my flashlight out of shock and mind you there are thin tiny metal shards literally everywhere on the ground. I can't see a freaking thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight. All I hear is quick pacing and shuffling and clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running directly at me. Once the metal crunching footsteps are within maybe five feet of me, I hear them quickly veer to the left and past me. Within three to four seconds, the metal clanging is gone followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes. I then grab my flashlight from the ground and pointed it to the sound. The old man was gone past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from adrenaline and fear, and I managed to catch my breath and called several emergency contacts. By the time they arrived, the old man was long gone. I believe that he may have just been there to watch the train pass by, considering the metal chair was facing the tracks. It's still there. I took a photo of it, more as a memento than anything else. Unfortunately, I can't share it in this group as photos aren't allowed, and... Now I'm in the office. I'm still terrified and alone. I have to finish my shift tonight and then do another 11-hour graveyard shift tomorrow. I won't quit as I need the money. I just wanted to get this off my chest. I randomly recall this memory at times. I'm so glad my parents taught us not to trust strangers. I am more thankful for my sister actually listening. So back in the 90s, my two siblings and I were walking from our house towards our bus stop to go to school. For context, I was 7, my brother was 8, and my sister was almost 11. It was a foggy morning and the walk was almost too quiet. We were the only ones in line of sight and we were a few streets away from the bus stop when a small white sedan pulls up next to us, slowly matching our pace. We looked over slightly confused and curious as a white woman with long curly brown hair was in the driver's seat. She was staring at us intently. She was probably around 35 to 40 from the looks of her, and this continued for a few seconds before she rolled down her window and said, Hey kids, heading to school? She had this weird smile and eyes that looked like they were looking through us. We nodded as it was obvious with our backpacks. She coaxed us with a wave. Well, why don't you three hop in? I can take you all to school. I, of course, being seven and lazy, was all about a free ride. Sure, I said smiling, and my sister grabbed my arm tightly. So tightly that it actually hurt. No thanks, my sister said sternly. The woman's smile seemed to fade and reappear in a fraction of a second. Oh, it's fine, really. You, you don't have to walk. I can take you quickly, she said, trying to sound kind. And that's when I felt the hairs on my neck stand up. No, my sister said, even more stern. My brother looked scared, and I was confused and alarmed at his facial expression. The woman then turned the wheel and pulled closer to the curb towards us. We all stopped in our tracks out of fear. Get in the car, she said as she stopped the car. Her smile vanished and was replaced by a toothy sneer. 
She was close enough that I could see her dark brown pits for eyes. I swear that she glared at us with just pure evil. And that was it. My sister picked me up and yelled at my brother to run. I don't know how, but she all of a sudden had Hulk-like strength. She and my brother started sprinting as fast as they could down the sidewalk. I clutched my sister tightly, screaming. They almost fell twice in the process, and thankfully, the car never turned around. Instead, it sped forward and turned down the street. They didn't stop running until we made it home. We locked the door and all were sobbing. My mom and father both were working, so we couldn't contact them until they came home. We only had landlines back then, and pagers were only for adults. And that's basically it. If it wasn't for my sister, I would have been kidnapped, and who knows what could have happened. Case in point, teach your kids to never trust strangers. Apparently I didn't listen. One year ago, I was on a local app where you could talk to people within your area. I met a nice girl there and we also had common interests. We hit it off right away and exchanged numbers and pictures, and everything seemed to be perfect. Almost too perfect. She was all over me, saying stuff like, you are very gentlemanlike, which I am, but that's just for the ladies reading this post. But she was obsessed with me, and I had never had a girl like that before. Even though she wasn't the best looking girl, she made me feel a certain type of way, you know? At some point, we wanted to meet on a Saturday afternoon and had a nice time. Eventually, we went to her place and had a great time. I tried to stay the night, but she didn't want me to. I thought maybe she had lost interest because of my poor performance, but I couldn't be bothered at that point. I went on with my day and left her house. However, she didn't lose interest. She asked me if I arrived home safely 30 minutes after I got home. We continued texting about life and stuff and nothing special happened. Until two weeks later. When I was done with my studies, I wanted to see her again, but something was different. The way she wrote was without emojis and more direct. When I messaged her, she almost instantly replied, which was kind of different because she always took her time. And that's how I knew her. But I was incredibly horny and didn't care that much. It was almost like another person was behind her mobile phone. I didn't care and said that I would pick her up with my car at her house. But no... She said that I should meet her at a local park since she needed to fuel up her car anyway. The location we were supposed to meet was a local park, but she wanted to meet when it was already kind of dark, which was kind of suspicious. But at that time, it didn't seem strange to me. I asked why we would meet there, and she told me to not ask any dumb questions and just be there on time. I just replied, Law, okay. When I arrived at the park and was waiting for her, she came ten minutes later, but I didn't care. I was just happy to see her again. She parked her car and I got this weird feeling. I knew something was terribly wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint what. I checked the location, looked left and right to see if there was something wrong. I even checked the bushes to make sure that no one was ambushing me. She didn't come out of her car for the next two to three minutes. I thought it was just stupid, an unfunny joke of hers like she sometimes did before. I couldn't see into her car because the windows were tinted, so I really couldn't see through the windows and stood about 20 to 30 meters away. I was waiting for her to come out of her car, but she still didn't. I was smiling at her car, probably because of nervousness, and I thought that she was playing an unfunny joke on me like I said, and then suddenly, I got a call. I pulled out my mobile phone and saw her name, but at the time, I heard doors opening, not just one door but two or even more. The car was parked horizontally, so I couldn't see if there were more passengers who had opened the doors, but one thing I knew was that my body was instantly in fight or flight mode. I knew something was extremely wrong. I ran for my life without even looking back to see who or what exited that car. After I managed to escape, I deleted and blocked her number. I believe to this day that she cheated on her boyfriend and he somehow found out and wanted to beat me up or do even more serious harm. 
I heard all that stuff in the news about how people lash out because of cheating fiancés and wives, and I didn't want to be another statistic. I don't even believe that she was in the car. There were probably two or more guys who intended to do serious harm to me. I was kind of surprised at how fast it could run when I actually tried, perhaps because of the adrenaline. But my god, what a feeling that was. I had a memory resurface recently which I had to double check with my mom for reassurance and unfortunately she confirmed that it was true. It was triggered by someone on the street outside my job peeking inside through a very small window. They were harmless but the sight of their face suddenly reminded me of a long forgotten memory from the first house I lived in as a child. We moved out of this house when I was six years old. A fence was built around the time that I was old enough to start walking but my parents were still always wary of letting me outside until we moved away. I used to resent it, but now I think I understand why. Apparently, we had a neighbor a few doors down who was a registered offender. He had been required to notify his neighbors via his social worker when he moved in. He had a habit of doing odd, off-putting things around the neighborhood. He once sprinted across the street and left a human-sized dent in our neighbor's garage door. He also walked into another neighbor's back door, trembling, and asked to be held by her. She kicked him out and called the police when she discovered that he also had an erection. I found out a lot of this by researching his name after my mom confirmed my story. I also found his Facebook page, which included a photo of him, sealing any doubt in my mind that I had imagined it. His face was as clear as day, the man I remember. The sight of him, even through a screen, immediately made me nauseous. My memory tells me that I was sitting in our living room watching TV when I felt someone watching me. It was the middle of the day, and I turned to look out our front windows to see a man with his face and hands pressed against the glass, the same man I saw on the Facebook page. He was smiling at me with huge eyes and an even more alarmingly huge grin. I remember being scooped up in someone's arms and carried away into another room. My mom confirmed that it would have been my grandma who was babysitting me at the time. Let's just say, I'm glad we moved. I was living in a small college town in Pennsylvania with my mother and brother in a small one-story house located at the corner beside IUP, and this was the 90s. My mother was not a good parent and had a habit of leaving us home alone from a very young age. One day, she was going to walk to the grocery store, which was about a 10-15 to 15 minute walk away. She asked me to go along, but I chose to stay home that day. I don't remember specifically why, but a few minutes after she left, I changed my mind. I looked out the window and saw her standing with my little brother at the intersection. I ran to her and yelled, I want to go, I want to go. She told me to go grab a jacket. I ran home, grabbed a jacket, and when I returned to the intersection, my mom was gone. I figured that she had gotten impatient and left. In my peripheral vision, I saw a man. He was younger, maybe in his early 20s, wearing a black trench coat and spiked hair, and he was on rollerblades. He started to come towards me, and as a paranoid child, I started running as fast as I could. At this point, I heard his rollerblades behind me and he was catching up to me. I reached my house, ran in, and locked the door behind me. I grabbed this metal pipe that had recently broken off something in the bathroom and hid under my bed. I heard knocking and eventually pounding at my front door. I was terrified. I thought, this is how I'm going to die. I just remember thinking that if I was going to die, I was going to die fighting. I was going to hit him as hard and as much as possible. The knocking eventually stopped, but my heart was still pounding. I waited for some time, I don't know how long, but it felt like forever. Slowly, I crawled out from under my bed and as soon as I turned my head, he was there, at the window, looking right at me. I screamed and ran back under my bed, just waiting for my mom. Finally, she came home and I told her everything, but she didn't believe me. 
and that always bothered me. I always wondered what he wanted and what he would have done to me. About eight years ago, my girlfriends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. Definitely not the smartest, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. This one night we met a guy, we'll call him Todd. Todd was an odd guy. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got this feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Ronnie's Point, a very interesting place in West Virginia. You should look it up if you're into ghost and haunted history. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area while us girls went ahead to explore. Red flag. I was so sure that he was going to try and actually steal my car. We went into the abandoned hospital and, out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. He scared us so bad and we let out a slight scream. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum, it's right next to the hospital, and that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, how much fun would that be? We continued to explore and Todd just hung out in the background. We eventually left and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas so I started driving to the nearest gas station. Maybe two minutes up the winding road, I felt his slimy hands creep up and start massaging my shoulders as I'm driving. I kept leaning forward to give him the hint that I was not interested. As he's massaging my shoulders, he's telling my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out into our car, how we never know who is getting in our car and how they might hurt us, etc. He started laughing again and I'll never forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders as he said, Maybe that person's in the car with you right now. I pulled into the gas station and demanded that he get out of the car. He actually did, and I just left him there. We got back home, and my friend went on plenty of fish to block him, but he had already blocked her or deleted his account or something. We never heard from him again, but... We stopped inviting random people to urban explore with us and ghost hunt ever again. This happened only three weeks ago. I've thought about it often and I know without a doubt me and my patient were almost prey to a predator. I work for my state. I work with people with substance abuse disorders, the mentally ill, and to a lesser degree, those with slight developmental delays. My role with the developmentally delayed is similar to a lower-ranked social worker. One thing I have to verify is that the participant is able to achieve their own personal goals set for that year, similar to an IEP in public schools. One of my patients has a goal to walk and or hike at least one mile three times a week. When I made my visit to her home, walking and hiking was what I needed to see her achieve. So she took us both on a walking and slight hiking trail nearby. Her and I are actually similar ages, ours being 40. As we were walking the trail, we get to a point that was much more isolated. We were no longer walking the trail that loops around a neighborhood pond with many people, but we were on a trail that took us through the woods in a cotton field. Her and I were walking and talking when she suddenly stopped walking. I looked at her and just as she went to say, I have a bad feeling. I had an overwhelming feeling myself that someone was watching us. Due to her development delays, I felt more concerned for her welfare than my own. It's hard to explain, but I didn't feel fear. I felt a feeling of protection for her. I looked behind us because I heard the sound of leaves crunching and sure enough, a guy who looked to be in his 30s is suddenly coming out of the woods and he's slowly creeping up towards us. There was no one else around so for this guy to magically come out of the woods and creeping up, I knew whatever he wanted was nefarious. I told her to continue walking and gave her a head start. I don't know why I even did this but I just 
completely turned myself around, stopped, and I looked straight at him. I just stared. I didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. But as soon as we locked eyes, it was as if he realized, now they know I'm back here. Because he froze and stopped walking towards us. I kept staring at him and then I started to walk back towards my patients so he understood my eyes were on him. Then as I walked backwards, I looked over to see my patient, looked back at him, and he disappeared as fast as he came back into the woods. If he had simply wanted to walk the nature trail, why did he stop as soon as I turned around and stared at him? Why didn't he just continue walking and pass us? It was evident to me that this guy was waiting and watching for a woman or women to come down the isolated trail. The fact that he emerged from the woods when he did made it clear that he had been hiding and stalking. I will forever be convinced that my patient's bad feeling and my own feeling of being watched saved one or both of us from whatever that man had planned. This happened a handful of years ago when I was a new mother, staying at home with my firstborn child. He was a couple of weeks old and it was time for me to get an oil change and tire rotation for my car. Instead of sitting in the dealership waiting room for over an hour, I thought it would be a good opportunity to take a walk in an arboretum nearby. I had visited the arboretum several times before, but this time I noticed a sign for Patriot's Path. It was a paved trail that stretched 35 miles across the county. The trail was divided into segments due to the presence of roadways and neighborhoods. I had explored other parts of the path before and never felt uncomfortable. In fact, it was a nice way to connect with nature while occasionally encountering other people who were exercising or just enjoying the outdoors. Without hesitation, I decided to walk along the path to pass the time. I was excited to explore this new section of the trail. And at first, the path cut through tall grasses, then it curved and gradually became more wooded. This didn't concern me since all the other parts of the trail I had walked on were exclusively in the woods. As I pushed my newborn in a stroller and enjoyed my time in nature, I came across a fork in the path. The other parts of the trail I had been on had always been a single path without any forks. The right path was on higher ground so I chose to take that route. However, as I progressed, the path became increasingly difficult for the stroller. Tree roots had broken through the path, making the ride rough for my baby. I couldn't maintain the previous pace, and since I was moving significantly slower, I checked my map app to see if it included the section of the path and where it would lead us. According to the map, the left side of the fork followed a waterway, and therefore I decided to take that route. As I turned around, I noticed a well-dressed man strolling towards us at a slow pace. He had his phone up to his face as if though he were on a call, but he wasn't speaking. As we got closer, I looked at him to give a friendly nod as I usually do when passing people on the path. However, he just looked straight ahead, expressionless. While processing this interaction, my intuition told me something was off. He was dressed in what I would describe as business casual attire, whereas most people on the trails wore exercise clothes. He wasn't speaking on his phone, which he held up to his ear and his other hand seemed concealed. It remained rigidly positioned behind his back, as if though he were carrying something he didn't want me to see. I chose to take the other path of the fork and convince myself that I was imagining things. After walking for some time, I heard the sound of flowing water. According to my map app, I expected to see the waterway by now, with the path opening up to a parking lot. I felt like I should have reached the parking lot already, and when I attempted to open my map again, I discovered that my phone wasn't working. I was now deep in the woods, alone with my baby, and without any phone access and after a strange encounter. It was time to turn around and leave the woods, I thought. But to my dismay, I encountered that man again. His expression remained unchanged, his phone was still in his ear and he still wasn't speaking on it. Moreover, his other hand remained hidden behind his back. My heart sank into my stomach and my stomach leaped into my throat. Why did he turn around on that first part of the path? Why did he turn at the fork? 
He was close enough to us for me to realize that he must have turned around soon after we did. He must have seen us turn down that other path at the fork. All the alarms in my body were ringing, get out of here. When we needed to pass him, I just started to jog. Hey, I'm wearing the appropriate outfit for a trail that most people use for exercise. Maybe my intention was to jog this whole time, you know. I didn't stop jogging until I was out of the woods and in the tall grass. I turned to look behind me and luckily, my son and I were alone again. I jogged some more until there was a huge distance between us and the trail, and we waited in the dealership waiting room for the rest of the time that we were working on my car. I did go back to the Arboretum after that, but I haven't ventured down that section of the trail ever again. Now maybe that was just a regular businessman. Nothing happened between me and this man, and maybe nothing was going to happen. But personally, I'd rather go for an unplanned jog than ignore my gut and find out. When I was younger, around the ripe age of 13, I used to babysit for my neighbor whom I had a close connection with. I was mature for my age and had been friends with her kids before they moved in with their dad, who lived about two hours away. Now for privacy, let's call my neighbor C and her son, who was on the spectrum, J. On Friday night, I had nothing to do, and C asked if I was free to watch J while she went out to meet a guy that she had been friends with for a couple of years. Before diving into her life, I should provide some context about C. She knew a lot of people, and not all of them were good. The kids in the neighborhood were aware of this because we had spent our entire childhood and early teenage years in her life, taking care of her kids and babysitting whenever she needed us. C had connections and a huge social status in our community. She had people who knew and loved her within a two-minute radius as well as those who were 20 hours away. So when she asked me on a random Friday night and mentioned a guy's name that I had never heard before, it didn't surprise me. C didn't have the nicest house or car or clothes. I didn't blame her because she was a single mom working three jobs and taking care of two kids and a toddler. At around 10 p.m., after spending a relatively easy four hours with Jay, I changed him into his pajamas and tucked him into bed. I put on the movie Cars for him since he was obsessed with it at the time and he fell asleep quickly. This left me alone in the living room. I called C to see if she was on her way home, and she mentioned that she was walking out of the bar just as I called. I could tell that she was quite intoxicated, and I hoped that the guy that she was with would drive her the three minutes it took to reach her house. About seven minutes later, I saw a nice 2017 BMW 3 Series pull into the driveway. Surprised and suspicious, I looked out the window to see if I could spot C in the passenger seat. As I mentioned earlier, C didn't have the nicest belongings, so this seemed a bit off. I saw her stumble out of the car, and the guy walked her into the house. I greeted him, but he didn't say his name. He smiled and thanked me for watching Jay so he could spend time with C. I assured him that it wasn't a problem and wished them a good time. Now skipping ahead ten minutes, C asked me where Jay was. I informed her that it was late, so I put him to bed, and she should go change into comfortable clothes. She ended up lying down in her bed fully clothed and actually went to sleep, leaving me, a young teenager, with a man in his 40s who was balding. We sat on the kitchen floor and got into this random deep conversation. At one point, he told me to knock on his ribs and, out of curiosity, I did. I heard a hard metallic thump. It was as if though his ribs were made of metal, and I pulled back and asked him about it and what had happened. He sighed and leaned back and lifted his shirt slightly, revealing a skin graft on his abdomen with a completely different shade of skin and stitches all around it. I noticed scars on his stomach and chest, some of which looked like bullet wounds. He closed his eyes and began telling me his story. He told me that two years prior, his ex-girlfriend had run him over with a car. Not just once, but thirteen times. My jaw fell to the floor as I contemplated the multitude of possibilities for why she would do this to him. My mind raced and I couldn't help but wonder, am I in danger? These are the obvious questions one would ask oneself when faced with such a situation, and this is how the story goes. 
He said, I had proposed to my girlfriend the week before, and she had organized a barbecue to announce it to her family. When I arrived and saw her cooking, I looked at the barbecue skeptically since she had never made one before. When I took a bite, it turned out to be really dry and I coughed discreetly. She asked if it was good and to avoid a fight, I reluctantly said yes. However, I couldn't stop coughing. She inquired about what was wrong with it and I confessed that it was a little dry. And this triggered an argument and I decided to head to my car. However, she beat me to it and got into her car. As she backed up, she intentionally hit me with her car and continued to run over my ribs 13 times. I'm amazed that I survived. I was in shock. How could someone endure such an ordeal? Was this older guy joking? Is this real? Who is this man? And I asked him, Who are you? What's your name? He looked at me and his eyes changed. He was deadly serious and he asked, Which one? I responded, uh, The name you were given at birth? He laughed briefly but abruptly stopped. He proceeded to inform me, a young 13-year-old girl, that he had hundreds of names and couldn't disclose a single one. He claimed to be wanted in 12 countries and many regions on the west coast. I started to sweat. I had no clue if he was being genuine or not, but then he pulled out his wallet, revealing at least 10 IDs, and that's when it hit me. He stared into my eyes and said, If you or C ever need someone gone, erased from your lives, just like that, and he snapped his fingers. Tell C to reach out and I can make it happen. And with that, he rose, opened the door, got into his luxury car, and disappeared from my sight. This whole incident wouldn't have been as eerie or unsettling if it had ended there. Perhaps he was joking, just playing a prank on me, but it only got worse. The next morning I asked C, what's the name of the guy you come home with? And she responded, confused. What guy? I described his car, his injured ribs, and his bald head. I have no idea what you're talking about, she replied. And to this day I still have no clue who that man was, what his real name was, where he came from, whether he was lying, or if he was even real. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas in 2015. Our command sergeant major became enraged because soldiers were not showing up on time for formation. He blamed the non-commissioned officers or the NCOs for not picking up soldiers and bringing them to formation. I thought that was a bit weird. Recently a non-commissioned officer, NCO, got into trouble for having his soldiers in his vehicle, bringing them to a formation and they got into a car wreck. Nevertheless, we carried on like good soldiers. I should add that I was new to this unit. I drove out of my way to pick up the soldiers and bring them each morning. There was one soldier who would just not wake up or open his door. I could hear him shuffling on the other side of the door. All I thought was, just open the door man so we can go. I couldn't care less if he had a partner in there or if his room was dirty. He was holding all of us back. I even told him that exact sentence. He then did a 180 and reported me to the Equal Opportunity Leader, or the EOL, and the EOL is responsible for handling cases of hate crimes. He accused me of being prejudiced because he was Asian, and I was livid, and I said, I'm Asian, why should that matter? His counseling statement should reflect the truth. And this is when the Sergeant Major got involved, not for this reason, but within a day or two. They moved all NCOs to a condemned barracks. There was black mold all up and down the walls on every wall in the hall. The ceilings collapsed in the hallway. There was a vending machine with broken glass and rats, yes, rats, running around. Some rooms had broken windows and one had pooped rubbed on the walls. We had a meeting with the sergeant major to ask why he put us there. He said, because you all deserve it. I thought that was weird. I called DPW to inquire about the barracks and found out that they were condemned due to the black mold, and chaos ensued. Doors were broken inward in the office area on the main floor. We took what we wanted, and some people even sold things. The building was a battlefield, to put it mildly. 
and then it got worse. We didn't know that there was a basement. We went to explore it and found it flooded. And in a drunken stupor, like any 22-year-olds would do, we ventured further. We stumbled upon water-warped furniture while entering legitimate barred-off rooms in the building. We thought that it was a joke until we heard a scream. We ran towards it like the infantry men we were. Someone ran away up the stairs. Two days went by and we noticed a few older men standing outside by the cars. They didn't fit in and we wondered why they were there. Older civilians with civilian cars. We joked about all of this, but as war veterans we were cautious. One night we got a little too drunk and went back downstairs to the basement. It was dry, but we could hear footsteps. We chased after them but found nothing. Those barred off rooms felt like prison cells. For the next few days I didn't think much about it, in and out and off to work. Until one night, I was hanging out with my buddy Deshaun playing video games. We were drinking and he left a few hours later to go to his room while I continued playing. A few hours later, I noticed an eyeball peering through my window. In my drunken state, I leaned forward and made eye contact with the person whom I thought was him. The eye contact was the main thing, with larger, whiter eyes, and I started to get the creeps. I leaned forward even more, opened a drawer and gripped a knife. As I started to break into a brow sweat, I was thinking I would drunkenly engage in a knife fight in the barracks. My luck turned when I realized the doorknob was jiggling. Just as I was preparing myself, he leaned his head in while opening the door and asked, Is Jack here? All I could think of was fighting, but all I said was, No, sir. He then slammed the door closed. Immediately, I called Sean and asked if he was messing with me. Sean rushed over and together we tried to figure out what was going on. In a complete act of stupidity, we decided to check the rotten basement. This time we were sober as we walked downstairs. On the left side of the hallway there was a door that we had never opened. Well, in our foolishness, we opened it. Inside there was a room filled with support beams, as well as, what we found, a homeless camp. We reported this to our leadership, but they did absolutely nothing. And just a few weeks later, I pcs or permanent change of station. I, a 17-year-old female, recently quit my job at a fast food chain after working there for almost 10 months. This story is part of the reason why I did not want to stay much longer. I worked the drive through from 5pm to 11pm almost every weekend. Seeing regulars was not uncommon for me and I would even memorize most of their orders and fill them out as soon as I heard their voices. Most were very polite and occasionally tipped. But on one particularly busy day, there was an unfamiliar, wary presence. I had just started my shift, so I was running food to the window. I made eye contact with the man in his car at the window and immediately felt uneasy. I brushed it off because we were busy and I had work to do. Later, once my manager set up my cash drawer, I took over drive through orders and payments and all that. There were lots of orders, so I was not paying special attention to specific voices or menu choices, but one caught my attention. It was a low, hesitant voice asking for a sandwich. I gave the man the total, and he waited in line. When he arrived at the window, it was the man from earlier. I assumed that he just forgot to order or something. Now, his car was pretty low to the ground, so he had to extend his arm out to hand me his debit card. As he did this... He mumbled something under his breath without breaking eye contact with me. I'm sorry, what was that? I questioned. I said, you're looking beautiful today. At this point, I'm super uncomfortable. Not only do I have a boyfriend, but I'm also underage and not at all interested. Oh, uh, thank you, I said nervously. I handed him the bag of food and quickly shut the window until we drove away. I half-heartedly complained about him to some male co-workers as we usually do with weird customers but I still had a strange gut feeling. A little while later, when the average wait in our line was about 10 minutes, 
I heard a familiar voice over the microphone, asking for a cup of water. It was low, but agitated and forceful. I saw his face through his windshield and walked away from the window so my manager would take care of him. This happened a couple more times that day, asking for straws and just random other free things. At this point, I was sure that he was just trying to look at me. I was so frustrated with him and the rest of my work day that I went to the bathroom and just cried. I usually have pretty thick skin when it comes to this kind of stuff, but I was just so over it. The rest of the night went on and I did not see him again. I thought I'd probably never see him again until my very last shift at the store a few months later. We weren't busy that evening, but it was much later in the day than the first encounter. I did not recognize the voice, but I immediately recognized his face and car. I swallowed my pride and took his payment, trying not to make eye contact. I called my manager, and he said that he would give the food out for me. As suspected, the man was back in the drive through not long after, asking for a cup of water. This time, I knew better. I sent a male co-worker to the window to get it for him since I was busy anyway, and once given the water, the man asked my co-worker, You guys close at 11 now, right? I was so glad that I was getting picked up by my mom that night. I kept looking out the windows, making sure that he wasn't there waiting for me. Now, call me paranoid, but I've listened to enough true crime to be overly cautious. I never had the stranger danger talk with my parents and we lived in a small town where I liked and trusted everyone. Starting at the age of six, I was taught to commute by public transportation alone or with my younger brother. I never thought that an adult would harm a child, except my grandma for some reason, to be young and being absolutely naive. Now when I was 11, I was walking alone at the beach when a middle-aged man approached me and asked to take a photo with me. I smiled and he snapped a photo with his little digital camera. He then asked me to take my shirt off, saying that we were at the beach and I would look better in the photo without it. I actually thought it was an appropriate thing to ask and I obliged and smiled again for the photo. I didn't feel uncomfortable or scared. He tried to make conversation and asked what I liked to do. I told him I liked to play video games. He told me that he had a PlayStation in his room and invited me over to play video games with him. If the sun wasn't almost down, I probably would have said yes, to be honest. Instead, I said that I had to go back to my family's room because it was getting late. He held my shoulder, urging me to come with him. I told him again that I couldn't go with him, and he just hugged me and said goodbye. I just thought it was weird in the moment, the hugging part and not everything else, because I was never really a physical touch kind of person and really liked my personal space. But I just shrugged it off and never spoke about it anymore. Years later, during one of my deepest shower thoughts, I finally realized how messed up that was. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, we are all just triangles. Hey, friends. Thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, 
Grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I love Undertime Slopper. <laughs>